Hello, welcome to the fourth and final part of my documentary on the Isle of Thanet. And in this part, I'm going to um, just show you some items that I wasn't able to fit into any of the themes of the previous three parts. Starting with uh, Crampton's Tower, um, which is beside the railway station in Broadstairs. And because of that, I'd always thought that this water tower was... Um, built to supply water to the passing steam engines but in fact it's the water supply of um, Broadstairs town itself. This is a reservoir which was designed in the Turkish style. Um, Crampton had actually visited the uh, Levant and saw these reservoirs and um, built one in the similar fashion in Broadstairs and um, Beside the reservoir and the tower, there is also an engine shed. So the engine pumped water from the reservoir to the top of the tower, and from there it supplied drinking water to the town of Broadstairs. So nowadays the um, tower and the engine shed house a sort of motley collection of items all related to transport. Um, so there's all kinds of things in there from uh, bus conductors, uniforms and um, pieces of tram line, models of railways, models of cars, um, posters, railway signs, you name it, it's, it's in there and it's... Um, it sounds like a bit of an odd mix, but it work, works really well. It's, it's, I've really enjoyed um, visiting it. Um, I'd never thought of going in it before. I was wandering around making these films, and um, I can highly recommend it as a, as a sort of additional um, interest in Broadstairs if you ever go there. These are the tram lines that I mentioned. Um, it's just weird to think that they're, they're commonplace items, but where do you see them nowadays? I mean, trams were all over the place in the 20s and they just disappeared completely. There's a sort of collection of railway uniforms and bits and pieces of model trains and so on. Lamps. This is the actual coach that was used in the early part of the 19th century before the railway came to Broadstairs. Um, this travelled between Broadstairs and Canterbury. It must have been very uncomfortable. I mean, the majority of the passengers would have sat up here. Um, there was only room for about, I don't know, six people inside. I think this coach still gets an outing now and again. The engine shed also houses a number of uh, different gauges of model railway light layouts. Um, I'm going to save the what I thought was the best one to last, but uh, just give you a view of some of these other trains. Great place if you're stuck with a, um, a young kid and it's raining just to take them in there and make them amuse themselves by watching these model trains going round. There's um, even a Thomas the Tank Engine one running around in a sort of gantry above eye level. Here's Thomas, a sort of circular loop around the entire shed just below ceiling level.
This is an N gauge layout that they rescued um, that the chap's wife was threatening to put on the tip and so he needed to find somewhere to um, place it rather than just throw it out so the museum took it in. Something I found really interesting was that if you remember back in part one I showed you uh, a brief clip of the old tunnel that had led a railway down from Dumpton Gap to Ramsgate Sands and they've actually got a little model of that. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a photograph of it so it's quite an interesting historical record little electric overhead electric railway that um, trundled through a tunnel brought holiday makers directly down to the beach in a second you'll see the best railway I thought I'll leave you to enjoy that Next up is the Hornby Visitor Centre, which is on the site of the old Hornby factory, um, just outside Margate on the Ramsgate Road. I think most of Hornby's products are made in China now, um, and unfortunately this visitor centre is going to be moved away as well, but um, while it's in Thanet, if you get a chance, go and take a look. Um, it's got a number of layouts. This is their Thomas the tank engine layout. Um, obviously, they have a big range of Thomas the tank engine franchise toys. This is on display as soon as you enter the, the visitor centre, but um, the centre itself is, is quite large and um, it houses all kinds of things that I, I wasn't expecting. Um, Hornby really amalgamated so many other um, brands such as um, Airfix, Triang, Skelectric, <coughs> Corgi, Cars, um, Meccano was, was the one where the John, George Hornby, I think it was George who started the whole thing rolling, um, Meccano was his first product, there it is, um, that's sort of Early, nine, early 20th century, he began by making these sheet metal, metal products for his kids and it became hugely popular. Um, as you go around this centre you can hear um, men, in, men in their 60s and 70s and so on with their grandchildren going, oh I used to have one of those. Um, it's a common refrain as you go around. There's an awful lot in here and um, I'm not sure if they've got one of everything um, but some of these old locomotives and so on are fabulous. There's the Skelectric, 
when I was a boy, I had an Airfix racing track, but um, a lot of the figures like that cameraman and so on, the, the Scalextric versions I had uh, in a second, I think you're going to see the starter there. I had, I can definitely remember having one of them. He used to raise and lower his flag with a, a string that you pull to start your cars racing. River Rossi, that's another one there, Italian company. Um, their models to me look much better detail. Um, really nice. I, I don't remember them as a boy. Um, and I don't know whether they still trade, but um, lovely little models. If I had one criticism of the centre, I would have said that it didn't have that many working um, layouts. This is one of them. I think this is an end gauge, I'm not sure. Here's some other. I think these are River Rossi again. Lovely little detail on them. These are all obviously continental railways. Um, these ones, I think, are some kind of German carriages from the, I would think, uh, the 19th century. If I look at them, and then they've got other. This is a Royal Dalton plate that they brought out in conjunction with um, this model. Um, classic trains such as the Mallard and the Flying Scotsman. I think a lot of people buy these models now just to have them as stationary exhibits like this rather than having, having them running around on a, a model ra railway layout. Background noise, but um, in a second you're going to get a clip with some sound effects as well. This is the, um, and those previous clips as well, are, are of the largest model railway layout that they had. It's very extensive, but um, as I say, I think they, they, they had such a large area, floor space, that um, I'm sure they could have um, included a couple more model railways in there. Maybe one with the Continental theme. I would have loved, loved to have seen those. River Rossi trains going round on the circuit. If you're a model railway enthusiast in particular, um, you've got this place and the Crampton Tower Museum to entertain you. I can remember having this Henry VIII model as a boy. These are airfix historical figures. Um, that's the Black Prince, Julius Caesar, 
Charles the First in the background. did a airfix did a range of historic ships I, I can remember having the endeavor but um, I don't think I ever got it finished um, they were quite um, quite a task for a young boy to put together but well worth the effort if you ever did have one and then there's a I think these were airfix kits as well this is a World War II airfield And some more up-to-date kits. Um, it's not just all about nostalgia. I mean, this this collection is is a a historic record in its own right. These are some Corgi cars um, representing vintage cars and cars through the through the ages. This is a very large model of a mosquito. Um, there's a mirror there that allows you to see inside the Bombay all the, the detail that goes into it. I can remember having one of those. I think it's a Thunderbird. These are Corgi cars again. These would all be from the 1950s. And then these are a range I just don't recollect. They are absolutely massive. A um, couple of feet long each of these models. Um, I think they're River Rossi. Um, but they, I wouldn't categorize these as uh, children's toys at all. These are models for grown ups to make. Um, they're in a room on their own. It's almost like going into a car showroom, they're so big. There's another big display um, of the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. So it's um, a large sort of airfield that's being attacked by German fighters and bombers. So suspended from the ceiling, there are all these model planes and there are other models on the ground. Um, there are some genuine vehicles in the as well, Bren gun carrier and a jeep and so on. Um, and the sort of uh, video presentation going on in the background. Uh, the one thing I didn't like about this display is the ceiling. Um, it's a sort of black tile and it, it really kind of suppresses the, the, the hall. Um, I think they should really have tried to have painted the ceiling a sky blue or something like that and then it would have set it off a bit more nicely but it's a it's a good model nevertheless they did have some sound effects as well but they were really kind of suppressed by the video commentary this is the brand gun carrier um, I think they've got these to demonstrate how much care they took in reproducing their models accurately. So they did have the proper detail on them. Some mosquitoes waiting to take off there. Big aircraft hangar. So another place worth visiting if you're in Thanet. Um, especially on a if the if it does happen to be raining it's a good chance to get indoors and keep the kids entertained okay now the next place i'd like to show you is um the graveyard of uh st peter's church and um i have never explored this place before um never it never occurred to me that it was actually there behind the church in st peter's 
um, is this massive area, um, massive cemetery, and um, it's fascinating to go around. A lot of it is really um, overgrown with high grass and so on. Um, they are doing their best to look after it, but the it's just a really atmospheric place. So I'm just going to let you um, explore it and not have any commentary over it. Um, give you a chance to read some of the inscriptions and to absorb the mood of the place.
believe it or not, there's another um, area beyond that that I didn't film, um, which contains uh, graves sort of up to the present day. So um, the churchyard obviously um, caters for quite a wide population of Thanet, not just uh, the, the small area of St Peter's Vine. And it gives you some idea of the um, uh, background and um, social um, classes of people who lived there. A number of graves of people who were in the um, armed forces or and served abroad and died abroad and so on. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, now the other thing, I don't know if you picked up... Um, I'm going to play you a couple of those clips, just brief excerpts from them again. Um, and I, if you didn't notice before, you'll probably notice now what I'm going to um, show you next. And if you still haven't got it, this is um, just a clip of um, apparently random shots of the trees in another part of uh, Thanet in a, in a park called North Dam Park close to Margate. So if you still haven't got it, there's a noise coming from the trees of a bird, and that bird is not native to Britain. Um, so next I'm going to show you a clip that I took uh, in my friend's garden. This sound, You hear this sound all over Thanet, and this is in my friend's garden, and it will soon be revealed to you. Um, which creature is producing this sound. So there it is, the bird is a parakeet. Um, now, they've been around in Thanet um, at least since the 1970s. Um, uh, I heard a story once that um, the original kind of breeding stock were either deliberately or accidentally released by a bird fancier who lived close to uh, King George VI Park in, in Ramsgate and that was certainly where um, I first started to notice them but pretty soon you would see them sat on lamp posts. Um, I even had one come down and sit on my shoulder in the um, whilst I was drinking in the Bellevue pub in Pegwell in the garden there um, and I hadn't drunk more than I could cope with it did genuinely come down and um, try and befriend me and these birds absolutely fascinate me um, I can't get over them but my friends don't understand why I make such a fuss about them but um, I just think it's a, a kind of wonderful example of, that, of how uh, creatures can be introduced into the wild and, and survive and thrive um, so they do they do warrant inclusion in a in a film about 
with, with a historical theme um, in the same way as uh, the introduction of the grey squirrel would in the in the 19th century. They are very well suited to um, making themselves at home in Thanet. Uh, they like the parks and the high trees um, and as you'll see soon there their colour is a perfect match for the foliage, so they're very well camouflaged. Um, they seem to survive by eating, um, looks like they're eating insects from the beneath the bark of trees. Um, I, I've never heard stories of local farmers complaining that they're um, ravaging their crops. Um, and they, they have bred in enormous numbers and unfortunately they they roost as well in huge numbers in literally in hundreds um, and I mean you've already heard the noise that one can make just imagine that um, multiplied over a hundred times I once was waiting for a train at Ramsgate station and I'm not kidding, you just could not hear the station announcements for the racket that the parakeets were making in the in the in the neighboring trees by the railway station. So next up I'm going to show you um some again apologies for the shakiness of the footage, but some footage of these parrots um feeding and making a racket in various locations around Thanet. Um and I'll just let you admire them.
finally, I thought you might like to know um, what this sculpture is that uh, I use as my opening um, title. It's called Hands and Molecule. Um, it's by a sculptor called David Barnes, and it was placed on Ramsgate's Westcliff um, in 2000. And uh, it was largely sponsored by the chemical company Pfizer, who used to have a um, establishment in Sandwich, um, but like so other so many other things in Thanet, they have um, long since disappeared. And that's just about it for my series of uh, films on Thanet. I hope you've enjoyed them. Well done if you've persevered and managed to watch your way through all four of them. Um, if you've never been to Thanet, to visit it, it's got so much to see and do there. Um, I've got very fond memories of the brief time that I, I spent there myself, and um, it's well worth a visit. Um, so once again, thank you for watching. hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you on the next film. Bye.